Uh, welcome back for the afternoon uh, talk. Uh, I would like to introduce Sasha Swartkowski. Um, she is an ergonaut. She brings a unique perspective to optimizing the organizational flow of work, bridging gaps with empathy and insight. She is going to talk today about the three unfolded pillars of digital business. Thank you. All right. Um, hi. My name is Sasha, and I just changed my last name to confuse everybody. So it used to be easy to spell. No, it's not. Um, it's Tchaikovsky, actually. Uh, you can still find me on Twitter as DivineOps. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn, because Twitter is pretty dead now. Um, to briefly introduce myself, I spent about 20 years in tech, um, and I have been a part of some companies you may have heard of, um, like Microsoft or Red Hat or GitHub. I've worked just about in every department of organization, always on technology, but um, in many different facets. Um, and I've actually been a co-organizer of DevOps of Chicago for a better part of a decade, uh, so DevOps Days is near and dear to my heart. Um, I've recently been foolish enough to start a, my own business, um, but smart enough to pick the most intelligent co-founders I could find. Uh, you may have heard of at least one of them, so they're Jay Bloom and Andrew Clay Schaefer. Um, Andrew has been credited in some circles with inventing the word DevOps. I don't know if he invented it, but I do know that he was the first person to tweet it ever. Um, so Andrew's been talking for about 15 years about the wall of confusion between developers and operations and the lack of communication and how it all gets hard and complicated in the middle. And in the last 15 years since the first DevOps days, we really have made a lot of improvements, but the core conflict is still there. It's still not easy to get DevOps right. And somehow, even though we're improving the tools, we're improving the parts of the business, it's always this squishy part in the middle that gets complicated. So there are many things that go into uh, creating successful software and creating successful business. Um, and of course, my three pillars are not the only things that are important to business. However, some things in business are really easy to get funded and some things are not. So right now, AI is really easy to get funded, even though um, if you count trunks on these elephants, you will notice that this is not a correct number of trunks. And um, one of my slides has like an incorrect number of fingers on a person. And this is all like, you know, but we're very excited about LLMs, obviously. So, um, the thing that gets funded very easily is innovation. And by that, I mean the innovation that is going to revolutionize the face of business and also just the like, new features that you develop in your product and also things that are at top of their hype in the industry, right? So right now, every CIO, CTO, um, executive has been tasked with you know, introducing AI to their business. And in many, many cases, it just that boils down to rubbing AI features on their current products, whether or not they're relevant. Um, sometimes we just m try to make AI stick with non-toxic glue, like cheese to pizza. Doesn't always work. Um, which also asks me, led, leads me to ask if another AI winter is coming. And despite the fact that um, LLMs have been highly innovative, maybe we're going to start reduction, start seeing reduction in their funding in the next couple of years. And this has happened many, many times before, right? We've all done, done big data transformations, cloud transformations, serverless transformations. Um, Every business has had an agile transformation and a lean and a potentially even a DevOps transformation always kind of gets thrown out after a while um, and we gear up for the next transformation. This brings me into talking about the uh, topic of this talk, which is the three unfunded pillars. So like I said, the, the three pillars are not the only things that are important to building software. It's just the things that chronically get unfunded, right? So the first one is technical excellence, or maybe just excellence. Technical excellence to me is the opposite of technical debt. It's when you actively invest in proper architecture and proper code maintenance and improving your code base. Um, there, so we tend to think about co technical debt in terms of taking shortcuts, but really it's more than that. So like some of it comes from taking shortcuts and making poor decisions. Some of it comes just from code aging. So you could have perfect design, but 
tomorrow someone finds a vulnerability in a package and suddenly your perfect design is no longer perfect and your code is no longer secure. So software tends to age just like humans or like hardware. Um, and then there's changing world, and with the current rate of progress, the world changes so fast that even if you're not doing anything, even if your customers didn't change anything, your suppliers, your cloud providers, your hardware providers may have changed things, and suddenly you have to update your own software. So my hot take for today on this is that all code is technical debt because by the time you finish writing your code line, Yep, um, that is already outdated and you have to change it. But technical debt remediation is notoriously hard to get funded, right? Because, like, usually you come to your executive, which clearly has six or seven fingers, I don't know, something like that. Um, you come to your executive and you go, I really need to fix these problems in my software. And they're like, okay, is it going to make us more money? And you're like, no, it's not. OK, um, how much is it going to cost us? Well, like, I need 10 engineers for about a year to rewrite this component and update those software vulnerabilities and you know, re remodel this design and blah, blah, blah. And like, so like, they're like, OK, why would I spend $2 million to continue making a $1 million? And then usually this conversation ends right there, and you're not getting any funding. Um, so the second pillar is a platform. Um, platform engineering was a cool new trend in the last couple of years. I think it's already kind of um, dying off. But um, it isn't really new, because if you were in DevOps, you were always talking about platforms, because DevOps, in a way, is impossible without a platform. Um, one of my best DevOps friends, Matt Stratton, has this joke, you can't buy DevOps, but I can't sell it to you. Um, I like to make this joke, you can't buy a platform, but I can sell it to you. In fact, I have, because every major software vendor promises you that all you need is a PaaS, and that's going to solve all your problems, and I have worked for a number of those, and sold those platform as a service services. Now, there's nothing wrong with them, but unless you're right, like running a static website, they're not going to take care of all of your concerns. Right? You still need to optimize, you still need to operationalize the paths, and you still not need to optimize for your business, and you still need to implement things that are specific to your business. Now, the other option is like you think you don't actually have a platform. Well, usually that means that your platform is actually made of people. Because for many companies, ServiceNow is actually their platform API, and Brent in operations is their backend service. And this usually doesn't mean anything good for Brent because Brent gets uh, buried under all of the work. Um, but in the words of Albert Camus, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill the man's heart. Or in other words, one must imagine Brent happy. That was a reference to the Phoenix Project, if you ever want to look it up. But um, the third unfunded platform, uh, Pillar is reliability. So reliability is availability plus stability plus quality plus a whole bunch of other illities. Um, if availability means that my service is up and running, reliability means that it's actually doing what my customers expect it to do. So the expectations of reliability that we have had drastically changed. So in the 90s, even 2000s, probably maintenance windows like this were com completely normal. So you could take your website offline for two days do whatever you need to do to deploy a new version, and then bring it back online. This is from one of the cloud provider services. So like, if you look at the nines and you calculate the downtime, monthly downtime of more than one and a half days will result to, with a 100% refund to your customers. Right? So the expectations are very different. The other thing that changed that is major is we used to ship software on CDs. So once I implement the software, I shipped it to my customers, and then it was their responsibility to run operations for that software. One of the things that this meant is that most companies do not, like say, if you're running an exchange server for a company, you were maybe having a few hundred or a few thousand users, right? Now Google runs email for like billions of users probably, right? So we suddenly are looking at a scale where some companies with some SaaS providers have millions of users. Some companies that don't think of themselves as SaaS providers have millions of users, 
thousands of concurrent users and such things. So in large organizations, SRE was born out of necessity because you simply cannot throw enough bodies at this problem. You have to start automating. And then the goal of SRE is also not to take toil away from software engineering, but to drive toil out of the system, meaning that we're not looking at this situation, right? We're not like, okay, developer productivity galore. Let's just let devs do all the things they want to do and create all the variation and then bury ops under all the toil. That is not our goal. Our goal is that we are improving the system. We're bringing platform automation so that we can have gains in reliability. Um, but unfortunately, so this is technology adoption cycle was, was mentioned by a few people who did research on such things. But when you have innovators and the early adopters, they're usually in the game to seek advantage, right? So we've come up with new patterns such as SRE and there's like, I'm still a big fan of Google SRE book. There's a lot to learn from there. Um, but those people are seeking advantage, and then the early majority and the majority of the companies come in seeking legitimacy. So they're not actually necessarily looking to improve their practices. They just want to say that they're doing the right thing, right? Which, like, words cross this chasm uh, before understanding and practice, which also means that we constantly renaming teams. So. In the 20 years that I've been here, I've seen ops being renamed from like support, sysadmin, ops, DevOps, SRE, platform engineering. Um, I think there's something else coming here. Um, and the problem is that like, so first of all, we continuously rename stuff and don't necessarily change anything. But the other problem is some companies have all of these teams and there's no clear delineation between the, what the different teams do and what necessarily they're trying to accomplish. Um, that is, again, not the goal of why DevOps came on, on um, onto the world stage and not the stuff that we were trying to improve initially. Um, Speaking of things that um, you know, we need to rename to, as an industry, we need to come up with a way to rub AI on a job title because we all you know, like to get paid and we need to leverage the current trade. So as a wise saying says, you cannot step twice into the same transformation. And that is part of the reason why all of these things are continuously happening, because once I said that I've implemented DevOps in my organization, whether or not I was right about implementing DevOps, whether or not it succeeded, I can no longer ask for budget to implement DevOps. Now I have to implement SRE or platform engineering or whatever the next thing is. So I want to introduce you guys to a new concept. This is a concept that had been developed by my co-founder, Jay Bloom, who is a PhD from Carnegie Mellon, um, and he's worked on this concept of three economies. And three economies is differentiation, scope, and scale. So if you think about this, this is kind of like, and this is a variation funnel, so there's in differentiation, there's a lot of variation, and as we go towards scale, we want the le least amount of variation. We want to drive variation out of our system. So if you think of differentiation, that's kind of where business units live. That's where developers live. So they want to get more customers. They want to enter more markets. They want to do things differently. If you go towards scale, that's usually where IT operations live. So they want to control consumption, use best practices, and do the same things repeatedly. They want to drive cost savings. So Think about this for a second. The rules of the two games are different. So if we think about all of this as a game, the rules of the two games on two sides are quite different. And this is the core of DevOps conflict, right? This is the reason that this continues to exist even after we've worked 15 years to try to make it better. And the sides maximize local wins according to local rules of the game, right? It's not that people are doing something silly. People are doing something very smart because they get paid to, on one side to innovate, on the other side to save money and control stuff, right? So in good companies, the scope economy connects differentiation and scale to enable innovation and efficiency. And scope economy emerges from an ongoing negotiation between selfish interests in favor of the collector. One of the things that this is saying is that this conflict is ongoing. So even if you implement DevOps, like you cannot 
rest on your laurels and take advantage of all the good stuff that you've done. And you have to continue to negotiate those selfish interests in favor of the collective. And then the other thing that it means is that the collective actually um, needs to be recognizable by every party, right? So if, if all I'm getting paid on in, is recognizing innovation and I do not care about cost savings and I do not care about the organization as a whole, I'm just gonna, like on the developer side, run over my operations and continue increasing the variation, making their job miserable. And the same goes for cost savings. If all I care about is cost savings and I do not recognize organizational uh, collective organizational drivers, then I will just prevent all innovation. I will just put roadblocks in front of all of innovation. Usually this is a pendulum, by the way, that swings and continues to go back and forth. So let's talk about funding the unfunded pillars. Honestly, I'm going to uh, pull a dirty trick and say we could talk about funding the unfunded pillars, but we would not get very far because it's difficult. And the reason it's difficult is like we continue to get into the same conversation of like, well, why would I spend two million to not improve the amount of money I'm making or the amount of um, money I'm saving on this? And the, this is because I believe the challenge here is that the three pillars belong to the third scope economy, right? So if our rules for the two other economies are very, very clear, right? So in differentiation, I know how to win the game. In scale, I know how to win the game. In scope economy, it all gets very fuzzy, right? The, the scope economy acts as a clutch between the two other economies and it helps both economies be better but it is much more difficult to formulate how to win in the scope economy. So one of the options that you have is you translate your pillar, you translate your improvement project into revenue or cost, and then you will get funded. So one example that a lot of people like to give is the example from Google. So Google at one point many, many years ago recognized that half a second of latency dropped their traffic by 20%. And that, to Google, d translates very directly into ad revenue. So they made this, this um, statement, like, we want to drive latency down to make more money. And that is a statement that every executive easily understood, right? So then in the Google SRE, we find the four golden signals and their latency traffic errors and saturation. And so one option is, okay, let's all look at four golden signals, let's implement this in our organization, and then it will get reliability funded. And many companies have tried that, usually it doesn't succeed that well. Why? Because for most companies, latency doesn't translate so directly into revenue, right? So can you connect the four golden signals or door metrics or whatever other metric to revenue or to cost savings or to your customer experience? So if we look at another example, which is Netflix, and I hate that I'm giving examples of only big tech companies, but this is kind of, you know, part of the reliability lore. So if I'm on a couch with my cup of tea and my cat and my blanket, half a second of latency is not going to drive me away. I'm not going to drop off and I'm not going to impact Netflix's revenue. So Netflix, for instance, when they were driving reliability improvements, they actually looked at other things. So the narrative must be meaningful to your business. So what Netflix actually looked at here was, um, sorry, wrong slide. Um, so what Netflix did is connect the pillars to, to connect the reliability pillar to their organizational purpose. Now, it didn't have to be connected to revenue per se. In their case, they looked at customer experience. The proxy for qualitative customer experience for Netflix at one point was customer support call volume. So what they looked at is, will the customer support call go, go up or down to see if the improvements in reliability were positive or negative to their business? So if I quote Casey Rosenthal, who was at one point a manager of the chaos team at Netflix, it doesn't matter to the business if the parts of your system work together internally the way you intended. The business only cares about the qualities of the system output. So one of the problems with defining things like technical debt, I think someone asked a shy the question of like, how do you define technical debt? As engineers, we tend to look at something that is an engineering value. It's like, oh, is it implemented cleanly? Or is it like doing the thing that I exactly intended or whatever? What matters to the business is none of these like super technical things. Like I cannot drive improvement projects by making an argument about engineering code, right? I can drive 
the funding to these projects by saying, I am accomplishing something that's meaningful to the business. So one option, if we can't translate it very directly to um, revenue, we can measure improvements in system output. Now, I would use customer experience here, but not all companies have customers. But if you do have customers, the easiest way to try to find a proxy for this is measure your customer experience and connect it to the improvement project that you're trying to implement. So this is, again, another um, thing that Ishai talked about, and this is near and dear to my heart, and this is meaningful metrics. Now, the funny thing, Ishai spent about you know, five, ten minutes talking about how hard it is to get metrics right. And if I were to talk about it, I would tell you more things about how hard it is to get metrics right. Yet metrics are actually probably the only way you can succeed in your business. Um, but this is just one example of how hard it is to get metrics right. This is good heart law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So the, the cartoon here is like, if you measure how many nails someone makes, you will get a thousand tiny nails. If you measure the weights of the nails made, you will get a few giant heavy nails. The solution to this in this case is pretty obvious, and you need a balanced system of metrics. So each metric needs to be balanced with another metric to make sure you're not overdriving towards one thing. This is, by the way, the problem with things like lines of code or velocity or whatever. They can be gamed very, very easily to uh, make it look like your organization is being successful. Um, Bigger problem is metrics are meaningless if they don't impact decisions. So a lot of companies do this thing where they collect a lot of data and no one actually looks at it. Or if people look at it, they don't actually change anything. They don't change the actions that they take, right? And that's a big problem because why are you even generating all this data and you know collecting all this information if it doesn't impact your decisions? The other thing is metric is meaningless without a narrative. So a lot of companies that went and implemented SLOs and try to implement reliability are facing this problem where they breach the SLO, they blow the air budget, and they go to the business, and the business is like, I, I don't, you're making this mathematical com complex um, calculation here. I don't understand how this is meaningful for me, right? So your metric to be meaningful and to enable you to take the action you want to take, it must be connected to a narrative that's important to your business. In other, in, in other way that narrative is important is narratives help us be boundary objects between teams. So if I can under, understand my metric in a way that is meaningful to both dev and ops, then I'm bridging the gap between dev and ops and I'm making them both look at the same metric and it drives the correct behavior. So we, when we are looking at funding the pillars, we want to connect them to organizational purpose and we want to base them on a platform of shared metrics. And this is another example from Google and Netflix since we're talking about this, but these companies are both, were both looking at improving reliability. Now, Google came up with site reliability engineering, right? And Netflix came up with Chaos Kong. These are chaos engineering, Chaos Kong. Now, these are two quite different practices, but they were aimed at improving the same things, right? And they made more sense in the context of the company, in the context of the problem they were facing and trying to improve. And the point I'm trying to make here is winning practices like winning platforms are specific to your business, right? So you can't just say, oh, well, everyone's looking at Dora metrics. Now I'm going to be implementing Dora metrics, and that's going to drive the decisions inside my business. If you cannot make the connection between the Dora metrics to what's meaningful to your executives, you're not going to succeed using Dora metrics. Um, so basically, you want to build this entire house of organizational purpose that is resting on the unfunded and funded pillars. And you want that to rest on shared metrics, shared practices, and shared resources, aka platform. And this also, one, one point that I want to make is that leadership matters. So as much as bottom-up changes are great, um, without good leadership, you cannot arrive at organizational purpose. It is really difficult to connect everything to the organizational purpose and to the narrative that drives the collective if you do not have good leadership. So there's two options, and you probably should utilize both of them. You should be the leader that your company wants, and you should also find leadership coalition. You should find leadership sponsorship for whatever it is you're working on. And of course, since we're talking about excellence, I want to make this point. Be technically excellent to one another. And um, this is it for me. I'm Sasha Tchaikovsky now. Used to be Rosenbaum. Um, the QR code would lead you to our website. I'm, I would love to connect and continue this conversation. I went through this really quickly. I would love to talk about your business and how you are 
succeeding or failing at driving innovation and improvement.